Good Tuesday morning, guys. My name is Jerry Miller, and thank you kindly for joining us here on The Jerry and Jerry Show. We are live across all social media platforms, wherever you get your podcasting content. On the I Love Seville Network, a show featuring a Virginia Sports Hall of Famer, Jerry Hootie Ratcliffe. What this man has done in media, almost unprecedented. Awards galore, 50 straight ACC tournaments. And he sees, the for the first time in his career, a Virginia team get into the NCAA tournament by the way of the first four. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think they said on our, the uh, Zoom teleconference we had with the people in Dayton last night that uh, this was the 13th year of the first four. So, yeah, it's something that uh, seems newer than what it actually is, but it, it's definitely a new experience for for anybody uh, involved. Very rare to say, with a man of his tenure, to say that a first on the Virginia beat here. And folks, we'll break down this Colorado State basketball game. They are, depending on where you shop, a slight favorite to the tune of two and a half points, nine ten tip, True TV. We'll talk keys to victory with Hootie Ratcliffe. We'll, get, we'll ask Hootie to characterize this first four invitation and how he would grade the campaign so far. Tony Bennett showing some humility, some remorse, um, admitting that he made a mistake against NC State in the semifinal of the ACC tournament. Perhaps he should have had guys at the free throw line. Perhaps he should have had uh, a timeout called. Perhaps he should have fouled. All those stories and more, including a new segment on the Jerry and Jerry Show, scatter shooting around UVA, inspired by the best boss I ever had, Jerry Hootie Ratcliffe. Before I go any further, we'll give Judah Wickhauer, Mr. Consistency, the MVP, some props on today's program. If you want to work the studio camera in, and then we'll go to Hootie Ratcliffe on a two. What do you make of the game tonight, Hoots? Well, I think it's going to be a really good ball game because uh, the Mountain West has been a pretty decent conference all season. Colorado State uh, has played well throughout most of the year. They've been, they actually played uh, maybe a little better out of conference against some pretty good teams than they did in, a, in sort of a roller coaster year within their conference. Um, very senior laden team. I think uh, their top seven guys are either juniors or seniors, are rich or seniors, and uh, high quality basketball. I, I, I think uh, they're, they're coached by a, a guy who's been around for a long time, uh, who knows the Bennett family. Uh, I think Tony, not even, I, th I think uh, going back to his. Uh, Days with his his dad as an assistant at Wisconsin, so um, it should be a tight game. It should be. Uh, I, I know that Colorado State uh, they're pro perhaps a little more offensive minded than Virginia, but uh, they they also play a little bit of a slower pace and. Um, they they focus a lot on defense, so I th I think uh, in some ways they, they they'll kind of mirror each other to a degree. Um, what was going through your mind? What was the emotions? What was the surprise on Selection Sunday when they earned this invitation? I was shocked. I did not expect them to get in. I thought NC State took their invite. You can make legitimate arguments for a team like St. John's potentially over UVA in the NCAA tournament uh, field. Um, there was a lot of angry teams, and you saw that as they boycotted the NIT. Yeah. Um, what went through your mind when they got the invitation? I, I was surprised too. I thought uh, I thought when they lost to NC State, they were probably done. Uh, I think the fact that NC State went on and won the championship may have helped them to a degree, helped them slide in because that knocked another at large out. Uh, but it also showed that, hey, uh, one of the teams not in the top four in the ACC won, won the title, knocked off the top, what, two or three seed, the three top three seeds in, in three nights, I guess. So um, that maybe this conference is not so bad after all. But um, I, was, I was surprised. I, I did, I, when their name popped up, I – I was uh, definitely surprised. Um, this team gets in via the first four 
a first for the University of Virginia. The contest tonight, True TV, 9-10 tip. As I've mentioned, the Rams, a two and a half point favorite. Do you take anything away because it's a, a first four invitation? Some in Wahoo Nation have characterized it a backdoor into the tournament. I find that ridiculous. You're the Virginia Sports Hall of Famer, however. I, I think they're going to be even more passionate because I think, I, think. I think losing the NC State game the way they did left a bad taste in their mouth. They truly, truly wanted another chance to show people that they're a better team than, than what they've showed in that game. And uh, I, I think they, they, I think they arrived in Dayton with a chip on their shoulder and, and uh, I, I hope that they play that way because that's that's the that's the good Virginia that we like to watch play when they uh, are fully focused and a little angry and out to prove a point. Larry Redwing, welcome to the program. Folks watching in Buckhead, welcome to the program. Western North Carolina in the house, the D.C. area in the house, Northern Virginia, Charlottesville, Crozet, Lynchburg, Orange, Green in the house. Got folks watching in Tennessee in the house. I love how we're building this pocket of followers um, across much of the eastern seaboard and the mid-Atlantic. Hootie, questions are coming in already. This is a great one for you from Jennifer. Routinely watches the program in Richmond at work. She said, Tony Bennett admitted he made a mistake. I found his comments endearing. Please talk about this with Hootie, and please talk about the end of the NC State game that certainly should have gone UVA's way. Yeah, I mean, we, we asked him about that and, and a couple other things that were questionable after the game the other night. And he was, he, he, he kind of defended himself. He, he didn't, uh, he just felt like that they wanted to play defense and, and get a stop. And I, I think everybody, I think everybody knew that he had made a mistake, and, and I don't know, maybe it was the heat of the moment or or what, but he he just, uh, maybe he wasn't thinking about it. Maybe his thoughts were somewhere else, but he he wouldn't admit to that after the game. And then yes, last night on the teleconference, <clears throat> none of us brought that up, but he, he brought it up, that uh, maybe looking back on things that he did make a mistake, and he did. Uh, coaches aren't perfect. He'd be the first to admit that. They make mistakes. They don't have all the answers. Potentially three mistakes here. They're not gods. They're, they're not gods, They're right. just coaches. Right. Uh, and, you know, uh, Jim Beheim was at the game, and one of my colleagues after the game walked over to Beheim and said, what do you think about Virginia not fouling at the end? And he said, I would have fouled the guy five or six times to keep him from getting a shot off. I would have even sent him to the line, but he would not have gotten off a three-point shot. And so, uh, you know, I, I think it was pretty obvious that that uh, had they hacked the guy, uh, Virginia would have won that basketball game. Potentially a, a few mistakes. And in, in hindsight's twenty twenty. Um, I appreciate Coach Bennett um, taking the heat off his players. Took the heat off of Isaac McNeely for missing the free throw. Took the heat off of Ryan Dunn on a pretty bad foul at the end of the contest. Um, here's what he highlighted. I'm paraphrasing here. Uh, perhaps when Isaac McNeely was taking that free throw, he should have had Virginia players um, under the basket. Yes. Um, that's what he said. Then he said when Isaac McNeely was taking the free throw, perhaps I should have called timeout before the free throw. But he did not because he did not want to ice Isaac McNeely. He said, in retrospect, I'll take that timeout moving forward. And then he said that he probably should have fouled after Isaac McNeely missed that free throw because they had fouls to give. Um, and, and I probably shouldn't have let them make, take that three-pointer. Um, I appreciated the humility. And I appreciated uh, the fact that he... Um, you know, almost taking a page out of his dad, Dick Bennett's book, who was very much an iron fist authoritarian. Yes. But when Coach Bennett, and I'm talking Dick Bennett um, now, um, realized perhaps the next day that he stepped out of line, he was quick to pull his players together and say, I was wrong here. I either lost my temper. I took it too far. I'm sorry. Yeah, and, I, and, and Tony talked about that during the, the uh, 
interviews last night, and that, that that may be the main thing that he took away from his father. He learned a tremendous amount, obviously, uh, about coaching basketball and <clears throat> the psychology of it all. But that was his main gift from his father was that sometimes he would maybe cross the line, go a little too far in criticizing players or getting on them. Uh, but he was always the first guy to come back the next day and and apologize and, and say, uh, please forgive me, guys, I need you. And uh, that's, that's uh, I think that's a lot about what coaching is, is all about. I, I was always fascinated <clears throat> growing up by Vince Lombardi, who was about as disciplinarian uh, as you could possibly be and get by with it without going to jail. And uh, I remember talking to a lot of the old Green Bay Packers that, um, again, I was just fascinated by that whole regime about what it was like to play for Lombardi. And then they said, you know, uh, the guy would uh, uh, the guy would be the first to get on you, but he would also be the first to come back and, and praise you if you uh, deserved it. So, And Bear Bryant was a lot like that, too, at Alabama, another one of the uh, coaches that I looked up to when I was growing up and I wanted to be a football coach and um, I, I think that's um, a gift that uh, that the really great coaches have. Uh, questions, put them in the feed, I'll relay them live on air. James Watson, welcome to the program. Bill McChesney, Johnny Ornalis, welcome to the program. Mr. DL, Georgia Gilmer, Aaron King, welcome to the program. Uh, Lloyd Snook, welcome to the program. Thank you for watching. Max Edelson, Carol Thorpe, Patty Rowe, welcome to the program. Trip Stewart, Ray Cadell, welcome to the program. Six states right now, on the seven states right now, watching us on the Jerry and Jerry Show. Questions coming in for Hootie. This one's a very good one. Virginia has got to shoot the basketball well against Colorado State, especially considering the free throw difficulties. Please ask Rackliff this question. Do you think they can turn the tide with the jump shot against Colorado State? I think they can. Uh, <clears throat> the Rams are, are not a really big team. I think they have two 6'8 guys in their top seven. Most of the other guys are like 6'4", six, 6'5 six, guards. And um, <clears throat> I think that might help Virginia a little bit in that respect uh, in, in terms of spreading the floor and, and maybe having a little bit more inside presence to help them spread the floor with uh, Groves and Dunn and Miner and Buchanan. Uh, they might be able to be a little more effective in the paint and open up the perimeter a little bit for, for Groves when he moves slides outside and for um, Murray. Uh, How about Tay Murray? Rody and, uh, and, B and Bigman and uh, McNeely. Uh, Murray has been, I asked Tony Bennett last week, um, I guess right before the ACC tournament, I said, do you think that Tane Murray could be the X factor in the postseason? And he, he agreed. He said, I think he could be if he can continue to play and contribute the way he has the last 10 days or so of the regular season. And, and Murray did. He delivered. Uh, he gave them some good minutes, some good nice stretches. And, uh, He's he's got a jump shot that you got to respect, and and like Tony said when we were talking, he said you know he he doesn't really have to hit that shot all the time, but he has to show be it be the threat. Yeah, and people have to respect that threat. So that 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 means a lot too. Um, Tane Murray, and and we'll spend some time with him here. He's done some stuff off the dribble drive to the rack that has blown my mind. Yeah, he's got a couple of nice moves. A couple of nice moves. And it's because they have to respect the jump shot so much. They're, they're giving so much attention to his shooting ability that it opens up some driving lanes for him personally. Also, another thing we should highlight with Tane Murray, Tane Murray is this is a pretty big boy. He is considerably oh, yeah. taller, uh, and it's noticeable on television when you're watching the broadcast, than, say, an Isaac McNeely. So that height also gives him an opportunity to get the shot off. When Murray's on one side or when Murray's running the floor and when Groves is set up behind the arc and McNeely are set up behind the arc, there's tremendous opportunity over there for Reese Beekman. And Reese Beekman's been taking advantage of it. Yeah, and his, uh, his outside shooting has uh, stepped up a level 
uh, in the last few weeks. And I think it probably will continue to do so. He he's, um, he used to be reluctant to take that shot, but now he, he fires it without uh, even having to think about it. And that, that's a good thing because he's a better shooter than he ever, uh, I think, was given credit for. And it shows now. And um, the with the threat of him being able to dribble drive and um, – straight line drive to the basket, uh, that makes him even more dangerous. Florence Worley Via, thank you for watching the program today. We very much appreciate you. Craig Thomas Johnson, thank you for watching the program. How about Andrew Rohde coming off the bench and giving this team a spark? Playing with a, a almost a pep or, a, or a, another step of, of, of confidence. Yeah, maybe he was feeling the pressure a little bit too much starting and, and not delivering at times. And that that can weigh on a player, particularly a new guy in the system, in a new system. Uh, confidence is a huge part of, of, of any sport, and particularly if you're a guy who's supposed to come in and, Score. and shoot the lights out of yeah. it and, and you're not doing that, it can, it can almost destroy you. And so uh, I think he probably relishes the the aspect that he can come in off the bench and give some instant energy and uh, maybe not as much pressure on his back to, to deliver as when you're starting and, and, and failing. Well said, Hootie. Um, let's talk Ryan Dunn. Um, I'd love to see Ryan Dunn emerge even more. I mean, the guy is a shot blocker. The guy's a rebounder. Oftentimes, and, and it may not be his best role, but oftentimes he's having to guard um, opponents' top post players. Mm -hmm. um, Ryan Dunn, for this team to make a deep push, I would love to see a little more offensive production. Yeah, and he's taking it to the rack a little bit more uh, of late. I think he realizes that that's something he needs to deliver upon, and... Uh, He's done a pretty decent job of it. Um, I mean, his defense is sensational. You, you can't compare it to anybody else's that I know of. It's just different. And the way he can get up and block and his wingspan, uh, Jeff Capel pointed out that he said, the first time I saw Ryan Dunn play defense, he, he said, my jaw dropped. He said, I've never seen a kid – that young be able to do some of the things he can do. And, and we've only seen that blossom over his two years here. His offense, I think, will just continue to get better as he grows. But um, the fact that he's trying to attack the basket a little bit more and being a little more aggressive, I think, has helped. And uh, I would love to see him do that going forward and starting tonight and, and assuming they get by. Um, the Ram, Colorado State. I, you know, I, when he goes into the down to Charlotte, assuming they get there, it's going to be important, almost a necessity for him to to be more aggressive. And Jeff Paul watching the program right now in Vermont. We appreciate the retweet on Jeff Paul's uh, Twitter account, Hootie's uh, Twitter account, um, going bananas right now. Um, viewers and listeners, let us know your thoughts. I'll throw this to you, Hootie. Here's the crazy thing about this team. The crazy thing is this team can either go – if they can stroke it from downtown and hit some jump shots and score if, – if the jump shot is on, this team can be a world beater. Oh, yeah. This team also, if the jump shot's not off, can lose to – can Some you, of the bottom teams in the Atlantic Coast Conference. And, and they have. <laughs> yeah, right. So it's like um, a tale of two teams. And I do not know which team is going to come out against the Rams. The ESPN uh, matchup predictor has the Hoos as a 60-point favorite, but Vegas has the Rams as a two-and-a-half-point favorite. Um, I had Virginia in my bracket winning this game, winning the first-round matchup, and then losing to Tennessee in the second round. Yeah, I, I would too. And, um, I, you know, we saw it last year against Furman uh, when the shooting let him down uh, down the stretch. We saw it against Ohio the year before when they struggled to make points, make baskets. Uh, when they're off, uh, they are off. They're off. And they're, they're, not a, they're, they're a very beatable team. But when that three-point 
shot is falling, uh, they're almost unbeatable. Right. Uh, the, the NC State game the other night was the first time in 15 games this season where they made at least six pointers and lost six three pointers and lost the game. So um, and they should have won the game. And they should have won. Yeah. And there's no question about it. Um, so it just goes to show if 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 the three pointers are falling. You better watch out because this team is awfully hard to beat. Uh, I'll throw this to you here. And this is what one of the viewers has put in the feed. Spencer's watching the program right now, Southwestern Virginia. I'll paraphrase Spencer's comments. Um, and they're to the tune of this. Groves, McNeely, those two guys almost shoot the basketball better from bonus fear than they do inside the arc. When McNeely and Groves are shooting from downtown, they stroke it to the tune of 50%, right below. Yeah. Once they get in the paint or in that mid-range game, not nearly as confident with the jump shot. Also on the free throw line. What do you think is up with that? I don't have an answer for that. I really don't. <laughs> uh, I mean, some guys just, uh, I think they work on the three so hard that it's come so naturally to them that, Anything other than that is somewhat foreign to them. And uh, McNeely, anytime he lets go of a three, I, I, I expect to go. I, I do. I yeah. really do. I, I don't think. I never think about him missing, and I, I'm sure he doesn't either. Uh, Groves, um, when he was at Oklahoma, he was hot and cold. He he started out uh, last season really hot, almost unstoppable then uh, fell into a 10-game slump at the end of the season. And this year uh, it's been kind of inconsistent up and down. But um, I, I think you're right. I, I, I like his three-point chances a lot better than his two-pointer. And, again, I, I don't know what causes that, really. I mean, and I'm still mystified that this entire team's Lack of success at the free throw line. I've never seen anything quite like it. They they go to the free throw line and almost like deer in headlights. Yeah, and I, I don't understand that. Uh, we need to highlight um, some other successes here for this Virginia basketball team. Then we'll talk keys to victory tonight against the Rams. Tip off, True TV, 9, 10 p.m., a late one for us uh, folks that like to go to bed a little bit early. T.J. Miner. Excuse me, I always call him the Orange County, the Orange County graduate, TJ Miner, a guy who I covered while working for Hootie Ratcliffe at the Daily Progress. Jordan Miner um, and his defense against Quinton Post. Um, Quinton Post torches Virginia. I'm thinking Boston College is going to beat the Hoos in the quarterfinals. Key adjustment, Coach Bennett says, look, we're going to close the rest of the game with Jordan Miner against a seven-footer who's clearly got professional upside. Yep. And Miner, who's undersized, shuts him down. A lot of that is just sheer determination and focus on your assignment and, and what you're doing. Uh, I mean, he wanted to make everything as hard on post as he possibly could, not give him anything easy. And uh, hats off to him. He did an incredible job. He, he worked his butt off to try to shut that guy down. I mean, you think about it. When he came into the game with that assignment the second time, at that point, Quentin Post was one of three players in the last 10 years in the ACC tournament to have scored 60 points and 30 rebounds in three games. And he had those numbers at that point with uh, five minutes to go in regulation, then five minutes in overtime, and he didn't score again against a guy that's smaller. And uh, I will—I don't know if he's as strong or not, but definitely had a size advantage. Huge size him. advantage. And um, I, I, hats off to Jordan Miner for just having the guts and and the fortitude to, and the focus to be able to take away his strengths and and not let him beat him. Yeah, absolutely. Miner helps push the Hoos to victory against Boston College. Now, he could not duplicate it against D.J. Burns. What really impressed me with D.J. Burns, yes, he had 19 points. Yes, he had five boards. But the guy can pass the, the basketball. Yeah. When teams collapse on him, 
he can find open people and even do the, uh, what's it, the hockey assist. The assist that leads to the assist that leads to the, the easy bucket. Yeah, he's a smart player, he, and he's an elite passer. He has good touch. He has good vision. And he has worked hard on that this past year. Uh, he was pretty good at it a year ago, but he, he's gotten much better in that area. And I love watching him play. I don't like him playing against Virginia, but the guy <laughs> does it with a smile on his face. He's a really happy-go-lucky kid and, and a good guy. I, I know a lot of Virginia fans don't like him because <laughs> he can get a little brutal. Uh, a couple of flagrant, flagrant fouls in there. There was one forearm that he just about took one of the Virginia guys' heads off uh, during the game. And I mean, you can't even do that in football, let alone basketball. But uh, he got by with a few things and uh, more than a few probably. But uh, you have to appreciate his overall skills and the fact that, you know, he knows how to use his body to his advantage. He likes to get in there and bump and bump and bump and he will back you down into the lane uh, I know Miner, he likes to catch the ball a little bit further out than most centers do. And if if you're big enough, you can keep him out there. And he's not as effective, but not many people have the strength to not be back down into the lane by him. Or if, he, if When he gets his back to the basket and backs you down into the lane, you can't stop him, really. You, uh, you have to foul him or, or he's going to just score on you. Bill McChesney watching the program. He's the mayor of McIntyre. He says, Burns fouled Miner with impunity. <laughs> he, <laughs> yeah, I think he mugged him a few times. Oh, man. Burns definitely utilized his physicality to secure some post-positioning uh, advantages. Um, James Watson says, I was very impressed with DJ Burns. A 300-pound guy playing center old-school style, posting up and passing like Magic Johnson. Hopefully he gets a serious shot on the next level. I was equally impressed with DJ Burns. His game so well-suited for the college uh, level. Not sure how well-suited it is for the NBA uh, game. It'll be interesting to see if somebody uh, will uh, give him a serious chance. I, I think somebody probably will give him a look and, and see if he can fit into some kind of a scheme. He's uh, he, he's not a guy that gets up and down the court real fast. No, so no. That, that and he doesn't it. have the best leaping ability. No. And and, and and he's 6'9", 300 pounds here. We're not talking like 7' foot plus. But still, fantastic college player nevertheless. What would you make of the Wolfpack's run? I mean, magical there. It was unbelievable. I mean, um over the years in, in that tournament, we've seen NC State flirt with things like that. They, they, they seem like if there's one program in the ACC over the years that has never let that bother them, that they felt like that they, no matter where they're seated, that they can pull enough upsets and get to the championship game, it's NC State. No matter who their coach or players are, they've They've been magnificent at doing that over the years. It, it's it's mind-boggling. Uh, I can't think of another program that even comes close to being in that category. But uh, to play and, – and, you know, maybe we're overestimating five games in five days. Maybe we're th – you know, it would seem like you would be exhausted. Uh Absolutely. But, uh, you know, I, I, Kevin Keats told us that night, he said, he said, it, it, you guys are overreacting to that. He said, you know, some of these kids will play three games in one day uh, in AAU and stuff. So, you know, maybe we are overreacting to it. Maybe it's not quite as draining as, as it appears to be, but um, Certainly, they made it look easy. They they, they seem to get better in the second half of most of the games that I saw. Uh, when you should be, your legs should be wearing down and uh, affecting your jump shot and and uh, and your want to. <laughs> uh, they they uh, it was you know you have to salute them that what they did was remarkable. I don't know if we'll see that happen again, but that was unbelievable. Um, this is a great question right now from Brian watching the program. He's watching outside of Baltimore on our heat map. 
And he says, look, I'm a Pitt Panthers fan. I'm an ACC fan. I love the tournament. You guys got to talk about Pitt and the travesty of not making the dance. Well, I thought Pitt deserved to be in. They're, they're, they've been one of the most impressive teams down the stretch of the season of anybody in the ACC or even some teams outside the ACC. I thought uh, they've got everything that you'd want in a basketball team. They've got scorers. They've got size, length, play good defense, well coached. Um, I thought they deserved to be in. I, I was I was kind of surprised they weren't. I, I was. I thought they would get in before Virginia. Oh, here's a here's a question for you. This is a tough one for you. Should they have gotten in before the Wahoos and why? Probably. Um, just uh, well, although you know you have to look again. If you're Tony Bennett, like you said, you're looking at the entire body of work. Uh, Virginia had some pretty good wins early in the season. Florida and Texas A&M, who ended up playing high in the SEC tournament there at the end, and um, and had had some pretty decent wins throughout the season. Finished third in the ACC. That's nothing to <coughs> excuse me. It's nothing to sneeze at. Um, I think Pitt was better during the <coughs> excuse me uh, last. 10, 12, 15 games of the season than Virginia was. But, uh, again, they they view the entire body of work. And um, I, you can make a case for both those teams being – I thought they both deserved to be in. I, I kind of thought that Wake Forest deserved to be in, even though they did falter down the stretch, which is something that they have done, tended to do the last two or three years. And they, they've got to find a solution – to that problem because it's keeping them out of the tournament. I want to give you this question. The NIT saw a boatload of teams say no. And I'll rattle off the teams that turned down invitations from the NIT. There was a time where the NIT was a big time tournament. You hear a list of teams. I, yeah. Okay. You, you don't think so on that one, on that statement? No, no, I've, I've, I've covered. Uh, Madison Square Garden. I've, I've been to Madison Square Garden. Right. For the back when it meant something, uh, a couple times, and uh, the even though the rest of the nation would frown upon it or, or sneer at it, maybe uh, to see the players celebrate that NIT championship back at least back in those days, um, it was a pretty big deal. Pretty big hey, deal. at one time, the NIT was bigger than the NCAA tournament, right? Right, right. So, here are the teams that turned them down St. John's, Pitt. Oklahoma, Memphis, Ole Miss, Indiana, all turned down the NIT. Yeah, and, you know, it's interesting because the NIT changed its philosophy this season and wanted more Power Six conference teams in its tournament than in the past. And uh, for those programs to turn them down, it, that's, a, that's a powerful statement, I think, that maybe – Maybe it's the NIT has seen its better days and needs to go away. I don't know. But uh, when I, when St. John's turns you down, I mean, I'm Madison not. Square Garden is their home, for goodness sake. Yeah. And uh, they um, they are New York City's team, even though people claim it's Syracuse. But it, uh, I don't know. Maybe, maybe Rick Pitino figures he could spend his time better going into – the transfer portal and seeing who's out there right now because people are already jumping in in waves. Uh, Buster Taylor's son, for example, enters the transfer portal. Um, his son, a, a what do you call him, a wing, a two guard from Syracuse. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll see where he heads. Uh, he was very much heavily recruited by UVA, but cho chose the orange. Scott Aaronworth, the Esquire, is watching the program at Virginia Beach. He says, good morning, guys. I just tuned in, and I'm sorry if I missed this, but how did Tony Bennett not have people on the foul line? He said he made a mistake. How does a big-time coach make that mistake? Please talk about that with Hootie. We covered that, but we covered it again. We covered it, but uh, yeah, it's like we said earlier, uh, coaches aren't perfect. Coaches make mistakes. Uh, I, uh, I've seen some of the greatest football and basketball coaches of all time make glaring errors in judgment during games and I, I think they just get caught up in the heat of the moment they get a thought in their head about they're going to do it a certain way and 
and uh, sometimes they ignore the obvious. And it, it was just a mistake. He made a mistake, and he uh, admitted it and owned it. Uh, and I admire him 100%. for doing that, yeah. uh, for admitting that he made a mistake, because a lot of coaches won't do that. They won't admit they made a mistake. It's almost like my marriage. I, I got to admit I made a mistake every five, ten times a week over here. I say, sorry, <laughs> sweetheart. I was wrong. I'm sorry. She wants to hear the words. I am sorry. Uh, DJ, this is from James. DJ Burns played five straight games and dealt with Armando Baycock, Jordan Minor, 240 pounds of muscle, and a seven-footer from Duke. Think about that. That's his comment, the strong comment right there yeah. from, from Mr. Watson. It's fascinating. I mean, especially at 300 pounds. Yeah, I mean, the fact that, that he was able to maintain himself for five nights in a row uh, at that level of play is uh, – you got to give the kid a lot of credit. 100%. I mean, he, he, was, he was a bull. He was just a bull. Um, keys to victory. C comments coming in fast and furious right now. Uh, keys to victory, Hootie, against Colorado State. What do you want to see? Well, I think, uh, you know, the, the fact that <laughs> it's, it's a whirlwind experience for both these teams. I mean, Colorado State didn't get home from Las Vegas until, uh, I think, 1.30 or 2.30 in the morning Sunday uh, Sunday night, and then had to get on a plane uh, and fly to uh, Dayton yesterday. Um, Virginia was wasn't to that degree, but it was um, it, it was still you know kind of a whirlwind thing. Um, but I, I think um, I think part of the key is going to be uh, the matchup between. Big men and uh, and Colorado State's point guard, uh, uh, who was I'm trying to think of his name. I've got it on Stevens. top. Stevens. Yeah, Isaiah Stevens. Um, right, Isaiah, I believe. A um, six foot buck eighty five senior from Allen, Texas. Yeah, he uh, he is one of the premier point guards in the country, yep. and uh, I think that's going to be uh, just a fun matchup for fans to watch and uh, I don't know they may they may negate each other I don't know but uh, that's a that's a guy that that you can't let control the game and then certainly Bigman is is the guy you'd want on him to prevent that from happening but um, I, I think Virginia has to be it's best Virginia it has to be the defensive team that we've come to admire and um, without – which it's got to have no flaws against a team. This team can put up some points. And they've beaten some pretty good teams this year. Uh, they beat uh, St. Mary's and Washington and uh, I'm trying to – I know um, – I don't know. They may have beaten Gonzaga. I can't remember, but uh, they have. They have beaten. They beat Boston College. They've beaten some good teams in the non-conference. Um, but they're a team that uh, can hurt you if you're not playing great defense. And I think I think that's going to be the key for Virginia tonight: is play solid defense and to hit the threes. Uh, and, and, I, and I think I think they might be able to exploit the middle a little bit. Too, because uh, Virginia does have a little bit of a size advantage. Not much, but a little bit. This team's beating Creighton? Creighton, that's it. It wasn't Gonzaga, it was Creighton. Yeah, 69-48. Yeah. They took it to Creighton. Creighton, a top 10 team in the country. They uh, have this point guard, and Hootie's exactly right, Isaiah Stevens. His line is the real deal. He's, I mean, he's amazing. <clears throat> I mean, this guy's averaging 16.5 points a game, seven dimes a contest. Shooting 50% from the floor. This is the matchup to watch. Yeah. Two premier point guards, Hootie. No question. <coughs> yeah, it, it's going to be uh, like a heavyweight uh, battle between those two guys just going at each other all night long. And uh, Again, they, they're, they're both so good they may negate each other. I don't know. But it's uh, it'll be fun to watch. Um, key to victory for me, I want to – I think Isaac McNeil is going to come to play. He always brings it. I'd love to see Groves produce some points. 
This team is a different team when Groves is contributing nine to like 13 points a contest and his downtown shooting is consistent. He did not show up against NC State. No, and uh, you're right. Um, Virginia needs that third score every game. Uh, <coughs> you know you're going to get X amount out of Bigman. You're probably going to get X amount out of McNeely. But uh, there's got to be another guy. And whether it's Murray or Rhodey or Groves or, or somebody in the middle, uh, so they can get some points, 12, 14, 16 points out of uh, Minor and Buchanan combined. Uh, they, they need that third score to be able to win a game like this. Philip Dow watching the program. He talks about the free throws. Don't forget, free throws a major issue the team has. Absolutely. I'm not sure there's a quick fix on the free throws. There is no quick fix on the free throws. They've been working on it all season long, and, and uh, they do all kinds of drills. They do situational drills. They work on it every day. Uh, I'm pretty much confident of that. Um, I don't know what else a coach can do. Uh, <laughs> unless you go <laughs> to the extreme that if a guy misses a free throw, you take him out of the game and, and don't, don't put do him that. back in. But it's it's hard to do that uh, these days because you're sacrificing something if you do. Uh, um, this question's come in. This is a really good – this is an interesting question. Uh, Thomas watching the program in uh, Newport News, he said, do you think guys like Dante Harris, Elijah Gertrude, or Bond could be factors in these games? I think he's going to tighten the bench. Uh, yeah. Usually this time of the year, uh, and I know uh, he, he played a little bit more, a few more players against NC State and BC than he normally would this time of the year because, again, those guys were, the opponents had, were playing multiple games and he was trying to wear them down physically. But normally this time of the year, you're um, – you're cutting down your rotations. So I, I, I doubt it. I really doubt it. I, I don't think at this point there are going to be any factors unless uh, somebody gets in uh, really bad foul trouble or gets injured or something. I knock on wood. Hope, hope that doesn't happen to anybody. Uh, but I, I think you're more apt to see somebody like Murray contribute and make an impact than somebody else uh, – that far down on the on the roster. You think Murray's in the starting lineup? What's your starting lineup now? Is are Groves and Rody now coming off the pine to give some instant offense with a potential starting lineup of Beekman, McNeely, Tane Murray? Gosh, do you go Dunn and Minor? Or do you go yeah. the five spot? You go Dunn and Minor on that? Although the he might go Dunn uh, Buchanan, depending yeah. on the matchups, but because Colorado State's not that big. They're not big. I think, I think they have two six eight guys that play a lot. And, and Buchanan gives you a little more athleticism, a little more uh, scoring ability. Mm -hmm. Where Miner, he's physical, he rebounds, he sets screens, but he's more plotting. And, and the fact that Murray's been so steady, uh, I wouldn't be afraid to start him at all. I, right. I think he's uh, brought a lot of consistency to the lineup and, and – uh, made a major impact on the, on the team. I, I wouldn't be, excuse me, I wouldn't be hesitant to start him at all. What concerns you about Tane Murray? Is it, is it the defensive side of the ball? A little bit, but um, he's, he's not bad. <coughs> excuse me. Um, but um, I, I, don't, I don't have any uh, hesitations with him, really. I, I think he's... He can hold his own against most anybody. His last three games, Tane Murray, look, you're looking at a potential X factor here. Georgia Tech to close the season, 12 points, three dimes. Boston College, 11 points. NC State, eight points. If this guy's giving you eight to 12 points of production, you got a fantastic potential X factor here. A lot of comments on the feed here um, I'm seeing on Rhodey. What's gotten into Rhodey, and they're mentioning this in a positive way this time for Andrew Rhodey. 
I, I think, again, as we mentioned earlier, I think maybe the pressure is off a little bit because he, he's not starting. He's not uh, a guy that when he's out there is expected to, to um, produce a lot. And, and the, I think that pressure maybe have been wearing on him a little bit. And uh, pressure can really have its effect on a player. And I think I think he may enjoy that role coming off the bench and, and providing a little spark and bringing some energy, instant energy into the game. And uh, again, I, I think the pressure is off his back and it's, it's, it's helped him maybe with a different approach to the game. Uh, here's a great uh, comment that's coming here from Charlottesville from Grayson. He says, fellas, I absolutely love the interview with Ralph Sampson. I watched it twice. Thank you for having him on the show. That was a fantastic interview. It's always fun to talk to Ralph because there's so many stories. We could sit here all week and, and, and not even come close to co covering all the stories that evolved during the Ralph era. I mean, uh, uh, it's just countless stories. Uh, some of them have been buried, unfortunately, and I'd like to see them resurrected. I, um, I've thought about doing a uh, uh, story or two about Ralph versus the Russians. A lot of people forget that that was when he was playing, that was back during the Russian heydays of, of their Olympic teams, and they would come over here and mix it up with uh, – the U.S.'s best college teams, and Ralph took them on twice and beat them twice, I believe. And I, I know I covered one of those games in Richmond. Uh, but there are just so many uh, stories and, and highlights from his career. And I remember I know he was telling us about how what an impact Bill Russell made on his life. Uh, I remember Bill Russell coming to town and, and him interviewing Ralph over at U-Haul and um, so many, so many people like that came into his life over that span of time. That uh, it's just amazing. I mean, just story after story after story, and it's just I relay the circumstances of Ralph leaving the studio after the show, <laughs> and how he legitimately stopped traffic while yes. walking to his car. A woman on the other side of Market Street gets out of her car with a bus behind her, swings her driver's side door open, sprints around the hood of her vehicle to greet Ralph Sampson in the middle of traffic. Yeah, right in the middle of the street. Uh, and other cars blowing and honking their horns. With their windows down, screaming at Ralph. Yeah. Like, I mean, that's... That's... Can you imagine that everywhere you go? And it's like that everywhere. And it, it always has been. I don't think it's ever changed. Um, I've just seen him mobbed so many times over the decades. And uh, he's so gracious in how he handles it. Oh, he that. handled it so well. It didn't even phase him. No. <laughs> it didn't even phase him. He greeted the lady who jumped out of her car and he gave a wave to the cars driving on the other side of the street that were hooting and hollering at him. He, it did not face him. Mm -mm. No, not at all. And, and, and he's, he's been that way. Um, so I've seen him been, I've, I've seen him been put in some awkward circumstances like that over the years. And still he, he handled it very well. And, uh, it's a it's a gift, I guess, because I, I think most of us couldn't deal with that kind of attention no and pressure. Yeah, I mean, he can't go anywhere. Right? That's true. Fame. You can't, you can't hide seven foot four. I exactly. don't care what you do. Exactly. Um, so we'll we'll get to uh, scatter shooting around UVA with a, with a look on spring sports and some football. Football practice starts today. Yeah, we got to talk transfer portal before we do. Who wins tonight and why? Wow, I think it's going to be a, a heck of a game. It could be uh, one of those thriller dealers down to the wire games. I, I think Virginia will win, and I think it'll be because of the two things we mentioned earlier. I think the three-pointers, and I think the defense. And as good as Colorado State is, uh, 
the fact that they're seeing this live and in person for the first time, it's different than just, I know they said they watched Virginia on film. You're talking pack line? The pack line and, and, uh, and just the offensive scheme, uh, even though Colorado State can uh, be patient as well. But um, I, I just think facing all that um, for the first time live and in person is a lot different than watching it on film. And, again, the shots have to fall. Uh, and if they don't, Virginia's definitely in trouble, and, and they won't, probably won't win the game. But I, I think I think the difference will be that they'll be making their three-pointers and that they'll play good defense. And, again, I think the team is going in here with a chip on its shoulder. It, it knows it's got a second chance that they weren't even sure that they deserved. And uh, I, I think they want to prove a point that they're better than – and what they're being perceived to be. Not, you know, uh, Lenardi, I think, ripped them yeah. nationally last night on Twitter. I saw that. And, uh, he ripped uh, uh, Beekman as well. Yeah, and so... Um, what the heck uh, is yeah, Lenardi doing scouting Talek now? Well, he ought to stick to what he does. Amen. And he doesn't even do that as well as he used to. He's, uh, he's really fallen off his accuracy in recent years and... There's a lot of other bracketologists that are way, way, way more accurate than he's been. 100%. Jennifer Nunley Hux, I love the Ralph Sampson interview. We are so fortunate to still have him in the area and for all he does to promote the university and support the community. Thank you so much for having him on your show. Uh, we appreciate you, Jennifer, for watching the program. And Ralph loved this show, too. Oh my he loved being here. Didn't he, he text you afterwards? Oh, yeah. He yeah. said he had a blast, and yeah. he'd love to do it again. Yeah, absolutely. Um, all right, we'll get to uh, – how about this comment? If Virginia, if Virginia beats Colorado State tonight, how far do you boys have them going? Um, that's from Carter, who's watching in North Carolina. I mentioned earlier in the show I have a beat in Texas but losing to Tennessee. Yeah, I could see that. I, I don't think Texas is uh, as good as advertised, but uh, there's no way they get past Tennessee. It's Tennessee's just too much deal. of a mismatch. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, transfer portal, any news you want to hit transfer portal or you want to go to football practice today? Uh, well, I, I, you know, I know, all I know is that the transfer portal is, is already flooded with players. I saw on Twitter last night there must have been 100 guys that jumped in the portal just yesterday alone. And uh, it's going to be frantic for a while and uh, with <laughs> coaches. I, I know they got to say it's kind of like speed dating. Uh, but um, <clears throat> it's going to be interesting to see uh, where all the cards fall. I, I don't know that Virginia will lose anybody because of the NIL because they've enhanced that. I no think, Gertrude. A lot of folks speculate well, about Gertrude. Uh, you don't. I don't know. I, I don't know the kid well enough to know what he's thinking. Is that uh, the one you would think would be potentially a loss? Uh, possibly. Uh, it might be a lure to go back to the Northeast, but uh, I think if I, I don't, I, th I would think he would have to be happy here because I think he sees the potential that. Uh, he he'll if he stays here he'll be a star, and I think and a he'll starter, I think he'll get plenty of playing time next year. I think it was he was just caught up caught up in the numbers this year. There was they wanted to redshirt him to begin with. Uh, he was playing so well that they had to take it off of him. Well, and Dante had the high ankle, especially with the Harris injury. Yeah, um, they may have wished that they hadn't done that. Now I don't know, or, but maybe they felt like that. He had the itch and wanted to get some, a taste of basketball. But um, you, you never know what these kids are thinking. Uh, I, I would selfishly like to see him stay because I, I think he's just going to be fun to watch for the next several years. Connie watching on Twitter. Michael Waddell watching on Twitter. Uh, thank you kindly, guys. Mike Waddell has the North Carolina uh, Sports Network. I think it is. Uh, yeah, the North Carolina with, Sports with Network. With Dave Glenn, the Dave Glenn Show. Yep. They're doing a great job down there. 
He's watching us right now. Just it's gave one of the props. best shows uh, on the East Coast. I fell in love with Dave Glenn with the ACC Sports Journal. I love Dave Glenn. He's a great guy. And, and Waddell and me go way, way back. He's giving you some props right now. Um, how about this question? How about Dante Harris in the transfer portal? That would be his third school, ladies and gentlemen, if we uh, did that. Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't be shocked at that one because uh, his playing time – diminished after he got hurt. I don't know if he ever got back to 100% or not. And does he see the writing on the wall with Gertrude and Bliss? Well, he could, and that that's a factor because Bliss is going to be a factor. Uh, I know that that's going to happen for sure. He's, he's too good to keep off the court. And uh, so, yeah, I wouldn't be shocked about that one, honestly. Uh, this question's come in for you. Um, if you had to pick one who enters the portal, who would it be? Probably Harris. Yeah, me too. Third team in a couple of years. Started at Georgetown. Big East Tournament MVP. Coach uh, Williford on the Jerry and Jerry Show, an invite secured by Hootie Ratcliffe right there, said perhaps the best on-ball defender the fans have seen even better than Kihei Clark. Yeah. A statement that took both you and I back that turned into content on jerryratcliffe.com. We maybe never saw the true Dante Harris this year. Yeah, I'm not sure that we did. And, again, I don't know how much his ankle factored into that. I'm sure it had an impact. Um, but his offense was uh, somewhat disappointing. And that surprised me because he played for Curtis Staples, uh, scored over 50 points or 50 points in a game, a high school game uh, for Curtis out in Tennessee and could light it up. So I, I, I don't know um, – what happened to his offense this year, but it, I think that probably cost him some court time. He, he just uh, wasn't a very accurate shooter from outside. Um, folks, we'll talk football. We promise you, first day of practice, good night. March 19th, first day of spring, first day of practice. Hootie Ratcliffe's like, here we go again. Yeah, I know. I mean, I think they're having a um, – a, a Zoom with uh, Tony Elliott as we speak, I believe. So uh, I'm going to miss that. I'll have to catch it on the rebound. But, um, yeah, I, I think he has to be fired up. He's his third spring. Uh, the fact that he's got essentially, except for the uh, – well, he even has some of the first years in here, the early enrollees. He's, he's got practically his entire team here in the spring, which that hasn't happened a lot here in – in recent years, and so I would think he has to be delighted that he has all those guys in house and learning and picking up his systems and and uh, is this learn, a make or break year? Learning the culture, I don't know that it is. Um, I think last year it was uh, what the over under was three and a half wins. I think Vegas, I expect that will probably be four and a half this year, this time around. Uh, it's again. It's not an easy schedule. They haven't oh, done themselves any uh, a brutal schedule favors on scheduling, which continues to surprise me that they won't address that. Uh, maybe they have for the future, but uh, what happens if he wins three games again? That'll be back to back. That'll be three years in a row with three wins. Then I, I think Carla might have a decision to make, or or somebody above her might have a decision to make, but. Um, it's, it'll be hard to justify, but you know the, what the what he has to do is find a way to win some of the close games. Last year they they could have won five six games uh, or more with a few breaks or less mistakes. But one of the things in his favor is that he has a, a majority of his offensive production returning quarterback, including talent two back. quarterbacks. Yeah. Uh, some good receivers, some good transfer receivers, um, and guys that have been in the system for three years, some offensive linemen that have been around for a while, um, a defense that was somewhat disappointing last year, and uh, I'm sure they're working to try to improve that. So I, I think he has some things in his favor other than the schedule, that he, but he's going to have to overcome – uh, some of that to to be able to meet any kind of expectations, I believe. Uh, get this, guys. The spring game, April 20th. We're a month away from the spring game. The opener, the Richmond Spiders 
at Scott Stadium, 31st of August. Then you go Richmond, Wake Forest, Maryland, Coastal Carolina, Boston College, Louisville, Clemson, North Carolina, Pittsburgh, Notre Dame. You close the season with Notre Dame, SMU, and Virginia Tech. Not an easy task. Uh, Notre Dame's supposed to be pretty good. SMU is incredibly excited about being in a Power Five conference for the first time since the old Southwest Conference days of the Pony Express. The Pony Express. Uh, that got the death penalty. Yeah. <laughs> the only team to ever get the death penalty for cheating. And, uh, of course, uh, the Hokies um, made a statement here last year that left a last, lasting impression. And, and maybe um, – maybe uh, accidentally um, helped Virginia in, in the aspect that I think of Virginia, a lot of Virginia movers and shakers realized that they had to get more involved in NIL to try to close the gap, close the gap and pre prevent that kind of bud whipping from happening again. Uh, spring sports, scatter shooting around spring sports, Wake Forest, UVA, wild baseball weekend. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't get to pay as much attention to that as I would like to have had because of the basketball. But um, Brian O'Connor's got it going, man. Uh, he's got a really good baseball team. And, um, yeah, that was, uh, that was a fascinating series. That Wake Forest obviously has uh, thrown a ton of its resources into its baseball program, way more than most ACC teams has in terms of NIL. And uh, the fact that Virginia went toe-to-toe -to -toe with them uh, speaks volumes about the kind of talent that O'Connor has collected over there. We got college football starting today with practice. We got UVA on True TV against the Colorado State University Rams. We got the NCAA tournament starting Thursday. It's a busy time, my friend. The women have the, uh, the new tournament, the women's basketball invitational tournament I guess it is I don't know much about it but uh, today's Sam Brunel's birthday oh happy birthday Sam absolutely and um, it's good to see her get to extend her career a little bit and uh, who knows they might go deep in that tournament you know, they they finish the season pretty strong for the most part and uh, be nice to see them make some noise uh, the show, my friend, is always easy with you. Oh, huh. you make it easy. So, I just follow your lead. Jerry Ratcliffe, the namesake of jerryratcliffe.com. I'm on the website literally every day. Jerryratcliffe.com. Jerry, Scott, the team produce content that is captivating, informative, entertaining, enlightening. You name it, jerryratcliffe.com. Judah Wickhauer looking uh, snazzy and sharp over there with a one-button vest, one-button sweater. He always looks like he's just stepped right out of GQ, doesn't he? Look at that, Judah I mean, Wickhauer. Look, at, look at this guy, man. Always chill and consistent. <laughs> Judah Wickhauer. I've never seen the man frazzled. I haven't either. Ne i literally never seen Judah Wickhauer. You got ice water in your veins? Maybe he's who we need at the free throw line. Shoot away. Yeah, exactly. The director and producer of, of today's I bet he'd program. be an 80%, 85 percent free throw uh, shooter no, at no least. No question about at it. At least. No question about it. You don't need anybody at the at the line boxing out or getting rebounds or fouling when Judah's at the strike. Um, Hootie Ratcliffe, our star, jerryratcliffe.com, Judah Wickhauer. My name is Jerry Miller. It's the Jerry and Jerry Show, Tuesdays at 10, 15 a.m., wherever you get your social media. We love connecting with you guys. Check out jerryratcliffe.com, and thank you kindly for joining us on the program today. So long, everybody. Great show.